good to see everyone this morning. We do have a number of our folks out. We do pray that all is well with them. I ask an interest in your prayers this morning as we look to the Word of God that we may consider those things that will be pleasing unto the Him that we might be fed from the sweet gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'd like to continue as we've endeavored for the last couple of weeks, few weeks, to speak to you from the Articles of Faith of St. Andrew Primitive Baptist Church. This morning, if the Lord be pleased, I'd like to address two articles together, Article number 3 and Article number 4. The first one has to do with the doctrine of original sin. Original sin. That article says that we believe in the doctrine of original sin. That is, when God created Adam, he was good and without sin. When Adam disobeyed God, he and all his posterity after him became sinners, and fell under the consequential penalty and shame of sin. Number four is the doctrine of total depravity. That article says we believe in man's incapacity to recover himself from the fallen state he is in by nature, by his own free will and ability. Now, there's a lot involved in these two points of doctrine, the doctrine of the original sin and total depravity. We'll spend the majority of our time, the Lord willing, this morning in Genesis chapter 2 and 3 and Romans chapter 5 and 6. But there's some foundational things that we need to cover before we entertain uh, these subjects uh, in, in Genesis and Romans. First of all, I want to give you an illustration It has to do with what it means to impute. To impute means to to credit or to hold accountable. Now let me give you this illustration. Yesterday afternoon, I checked. And at about um, mid-afternoon yesterday, our country was $16 trillion in debt. $16 $16 trillion in debt. That is a 16 with, with uh, 12 zeros behind it. $16 trillion in debt. According to the calculations, that equates to $141,112 of debt for each taxpayer in this country. All folks in this country are not taxpayers. But everyone who pays taxes, that equates to $141,112 per taxpayer. Now, nobody who's reasonable will believe that we could pay that debt today. Agree? $16 trillion. We just couldn't pay that debt today. So what's going to happen with that debt? That debt is going to be carried forward for our children to pay our children and grandchildren and quite probably great and great great grandchildren are going to have this debt imputed to them and they will be responsible for paying that debt. Now right away from the perspective of our children and grandchildren and great great grandchildren that's not fair is it? But it doesn't relieve the fact that they're going to be responsible for paying that debt. Agreed? All right, so that is the principle of imputation, or that which is imputed to others, credit to others, or a penalty placed upon others that they're responsible for. Now, another point that I want to make with respect to our allegiance to the Word of God. These two points that I've just made concerning the doctrine of original sin and total depravity, all Christianity does not believe that. Out of the first century came several religious orders. Um, our line of Baptists began immediately uh, out of the Apostle John's ministry and came forward in a number of names. We've covered that genealogical history before. Our line of Baptist faith has always believed in these two points of doctrine, the doctrine of original sin and total depravity. Early in what became the Catholic Church, a man named St. Augustine 
was a, uh, was a wonderful professor of this doctrine. So early on, they believed this doctrine. There was also another group that, um, that began, or their philosophy began with a man named Pelagius. He professed that, that our relationship with God was dependent upon what we do in this life. And that doctrine today is known by um, the, um, the label Arminian doctrine, which came from Jacob Arminius. Okay, And that doctrine says that you have a relationship with God by what you do or don't do in this life. Okay, And so at least two tracks of Christian faith came out of the first century believing in the doctrine of original sin and total depravity. depravity. But the point is, it doesn't really make any difference who believes what. The point is what the truth is. We believe that the Lord has given us this Bible. It is the truth. And by God's grace, we're going to profess it and stand upon it. Let's touch a few more points before we begin in Genesis chapter 2. One question is, what is sin? That's, that's, you know, everybody's got their own idea, right? Everybody's got their own interpretation. And some have a position that there are certain things you can overlook is not sin. Well, John gives us a, a definition of sin. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4, John says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. That's 1 John 3 and 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. Now, he's not just talking about the civil law. He's talking about the law of God in which God issues commandments. When God issues a commandment, that is the law. Would you agree with that? Then there's the Mosaic law, which is another set of laws. But in this case, he's talking about the transgression of the law of God in every commandment that he has made. Now, what then is the original sin or the first sin? We'll come to it in a moment, but it is found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6 when the scripture says, and he did eat speaking of Adam. Adam ate, that is, he disobeyed God's commandment or God's law. Okay. Now, let's put these two together um, uh, so that we might see the relationship between the original sin and the doctrine of total depravity. The original sin is when Adam disobeyed God in Genesis 3 and 6. All right. At that moment, the penalty and the guilt of that sin was imputed to all of mankind. Now, I'm making some overall statements, but I'm going to prove it to you, the Lord willing, in the Scripture in a few moments. So when Adam sinned, the guilt and the penalty of that sin was then imputed to all his posterity without exception. Well, there is one. And that one is the man, Jesus Christ, who was also God. He was not guilty of any sin. Now, uh, <clears throat> the impact of that sin, what's the consequences of that sin? Well, the Lord told Adam in the day that thou eatest, thereof thou shalt surely die. We'll look at that in a moment. But Paul writes in Romans 6 and 23, he says, For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The result of, of that which you earn or obtain unto yourself as a result of sin is death. That is both the sin that is imputed to us and the sin that we commit in this life. But it goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, <clears throat> the idea of imputed sin is offensive to our human nature because our human nature says, well, that just ain't fair. Well, I'm going to give you some examples in a moment of things that was imputed to people that we would consider unfair. But I want to go to the classic example first. Let's deal with the classic example first. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Son of God had no sin. He was unspotted, unblemished. 
But we're told that he was made to be sin for us. Was that fair? The guilt and the penalty of our sin was imputed to him. Thereby he bore that penalty, that guilt to the cross, and carried it away from us so that when God the Father looks at us, he sees us in a state as if we had never sinned or as if Adam had never sinned. So let me ask you this, as you consider fair and not fair, was it fair for the unspotted, the perfect, the sinless Lamb of God, was it fair for him to be made to be sin for you and me? Absolutely not. All right. Now let's consider the the biblical examples for a moment of imputed responsibility and guilt of sin. I'm going to give you some passages that may surprise you. In the Ten Commandments, in Exodus chapter 20, also in Deuteronomy chapter 5, listen to this. This is Exodus chapter 20 and verse number 5 of the Ten Commandments. Moses communicating the commandments of God, he says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, that is to the idols, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So that says, when father and mother mess up, the children to the third and fourth generation suffer because of it. Is that fair? No, not in a human sense. But God said, in your human family, you're a family, and what one person does affects another. It truly does. We're not an island in ourselves. What we do affects others. Now, let me give you another one. In 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 10, you remember when King David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband Uriah the Hittite murdered on the battlefield in hopes of covering up his sin so that no one would know it. Well, somebody did know it. The Lord knew it. So the Lord sent his prophet Nathan to him and told him, David, you're guilty. You did this, David. Now notice what the the Lord's message to David was through Nathan the prophet. This is 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 10. Now therefore, now therefore, now that you've done this, you've committed adultery, you've committed murder, now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house. Because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Because David committed uh, adultery and murder, the sword would never depart from his house. Because David sinned, the penalty would be imputed to his family. Let me go through this with you again to emphasize the gravity of imputed sin. That little child that was conceived in adultery died. Even even before David's great and humble prayers on that child's behalf. David had a beautiful daughter named Tamar. One of his other sons by another wife raped that daughter. Ruined her life forever. Another one of David's sons murdered that son. The murderer, his name was Absalom. Absalom was David's favorite son, a goodly boy. When Absalom was killed in battle, one of the most pitiful passages in the scripture records David's words. When David said, Absalom, O Absalom, my son, would to God I had died for thee. The sword did not depart from David's house from then on. Trouble abounded. David would go on to describe how a family ought to be later on 
He said, even if it be not so with my house. And it's because that the, the guilt, the penalty of David's sin was imputed to his family. Now, so our natural mind says, well, that's not fair. Well, you and I are not sovereign. We don't have the authority to make a decision for God the Father what's fair and not fair. He is sovereign. And he has the authority and the power to make a judgment as to what's fair and not fair. Now let me give you another one. In Romans chapter 5 and verse number 14, the apostle records, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Now listen to this next phrase. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression." Even those who had not sinned, like Adam sinned, death reigned upon them. That was a constant cloud that hung over them, simply because they were human beings tracing their lineage back to Adam. But this Adam, I'm going to give you a hint now, for what will come later on, Lord willing. This Adam is the figure of him that was to come. While God imputed the penalty and the guilt of sin upon all men, that one man was pointing toward another man in a wonderful way. And we'll come to that in just a moment. Now, in sight of every one of us is a human nature. Anybody not have a human nature this morning? If you're alive, you have a human nature. Okay. Job says in Job 14 and 4, he says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. What that says is, given our state of total depravity in nature, we cannot make ourselves clean before God. Now that flies in the faith of, um, of the Pelagian uh, philosophy, the Armenian philosophy, that says that you can. That you can live in such a righteous and a holy way that God would be compelled to receive you into his household and ultimately in heaven. Well, Isaiah 64 and 6 says, for all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That says that at our best, we're unworthy. We cannot come before God and present ourselves a sacrifice or even a worthy person to the point that God would be compelled to give us eternal life. Now, left alone, without the rest of the story, that would be dreadfully depressing, would it not? That would communicate to us, you're in this state and you can't help yourself. Well, that's true. But that doesn't mean that there's no help. What that means is that what Adam did affected every human being. So let's go back now and see what Adam did. Okay. So we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. Actually, let's touch chapter 1 and verse number 31 first. Genesis 1 and 31. When God had finished the creation... I want you to notice what God said about his creation. By the way, we do believe in the doctrine of creation. <laughs> That's under attack too. Let me just tell you what I believe about the doctrine of creation. And you can say that is one more ignorant swamp boy. But that's all right. I rest comfortable. If that's ignorance, I rest comfortably in my ignorance. And I don't want anybody to try to shake me from my ignorance. But I believe it's biblical wisdom to believe that in six days, God created everything that is created. I have no problem with that. I am perfectly satisfied with that. I rejoice in that knowledge. And when God finished that creation, I want you to notice what he said about what he had done. Genesis 1 and 31 and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was what? 
very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. That is six days. That's not six days of six million years or 600,000 years per day or no such as that. If you follow the line of teaching in Genesis chapter 1, you will see that a day was a day. I believe that God is smart enough to figure out what a day is, don't you? So if he calls it a day, guess what? It's a day. So in six days, and we would understand that, in six 24-hour days, God created everything. All right? And when he finished, he looked at what he had created. He says, it's very good. All right. At that point, he had already made man. In Genesis chapter 2, he accounts again uh, the aspect of his creation with respect to man. And now it's beginning to focus upon man. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And he became a living soul. At this point, Adam is a perfect man. Sin had not entered into the world. There was no imputed sin. There was nothing but righteousness, godliness, and holiness, and justice about this man, Adam. Okay? Because God said it is very good. Well, for man, because of God loving man, we just uh, sang a hymn uh, just a few minutes ago. Our Lord loves me. He loves us. He loved Adam. He loved you in a wonderful way. So wonderfully that he did something for you that you could not do for yourself. Well, God loved Adam and loved humanity after him. And the Lord breathed into his nostrils and became a living soul. And uh, and verse number eight, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. That word Eden means pleasure. That was a pleasing place. You know, every day that we rise this morning uh, in this life is not pleasing, is it? Every place that we are is not pleasing. But that was a pleasing place. I believe on every waking morning, Adam, when he rose in the place called Eden or pleasure, he was pleased to wake except one morning. That was one morning that he wasn't pleased to wake. But at this point, it was a place called Eden or pleasure. It fed him. It caused him joy and contentment and peace. It was perfect. It was unblemished. It was unspotted by sin, by hurt, by confusion, by shame, by fear, by doubt. None of those things existed at this time. And then um, he fed the, um, the, the, the garden with the rivers, one called increase or a pison, the other one called gihon means bursting forth, the other one hit means rapid. And Euphrates means uh, fruitfulness. So God nourished the earth bountifully and provided for great growth uh, among uh, 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 the garden and the surrounding area for the benefit of Adam. He planted that garden and he put Adam there because he loved him. Our God loves us, uh, Ephesians 2 and 4, with what Paul describes as a great love. That is a great love. And we'll talk in a moment about just how great that love is. That love that still exists today. I love to be loved, don't you? I love to be loved in life. I, I love to come and be here with you all. To feel the mutual spiritual love that we have for each other. But I want to tell you something. There is nothing to match the feeling that our God loves us. That personal individual feeling that God gives to us and says to us, I love you. And you love me because I first loved you. Now, coming back to our subject now, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 16, and the Lord God commanded, all right? <clears throat> now, this Lord God has the sovereign power and the authority to issue commands. Let's put it in a little different way. He has the authority to issue commands. You know, in my years of the military, I... I was taught that if you don't have the, the power to enforce the commands that you give, the authority means nothing. You can issue all kinds of commands, but if you don't have the authority to enforce them, um, you have no authority. All right. 
So the sovereign God that we worship this morning has both the authority uh, to issue commands or law and he has the power to enforce them. Okay? You know, we can, the, the state of Florida could uh, pass all kinds of laws governing speed limits. But if they didn't have law enforcement officers out there to stop people who were speeding, that law would mean nothing, would it? You know, we'd get to travel 100 miles an hour between Greenhead and Panama City. Which that's a pretty good thing, I think. But the point is, this our sovereign God has the power, has the authority to issue commands and the authority to enforce them. So he issues command to Adam. He says, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely do what? Die. All right. The sovereign God has issued a commandment. And he's already given man the consequences of disobeying his commandment. Now, in our modern day, we get wrapped up and get off track in trying to figure out what that fruit was. If God was interested in us knowing what that fruit was, he'd have told us. Wouldn't you agree? I have. I like apples. So I doubt that it was an apple. And it affects us called all kinds of other things. But we don't know what it was. But the point is, God said to Adam, don't eat of it. And he did. That's the problem. All right. Now. God saw man that was alone. And so he made a wife for Adam. In verse number 22. And he took the rib that he had taken from Adam. Uh, and he made a woman and brought her unto him. So now there's Adam. And in chapter 3, we have our name Eve. Well, everything is still great. They're waking every day in the place called pleasure or Eden. It's a happy time. It's a good time. No sickness, no disease, no fright, no discouragement. Uh, just a perfect existence. Can you imagine? Only We can only define it. Our human mind is so unrelated to perfection that we can know what it says when we're told that there was a place that was perfect, but comprehending and appreciating it, we cannot. Because we've never seen perfection in this life. Well, you know the story. There was a serpent in chapter 3 and verse number 1 who was more subtle than any beast of the field. And then Eve was in the wrong place and the serpent took advantage of it and he enticed her to eat of what God had forbidden. She took it to her husband, Adam, in chapter uh, 3 and verse number 6, the very last phrase... Four words, and he did eat. My friends, those four words are the most doleful words that could ever fall upon your ears because they speak of an action that affected every human being after Adam. All right? Now remember what God said to Adam. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, the word die has a connotation of separation. For example, Solomon tells us um, in the last chapter of Ecclesiastes that when we die, there's a separation. The body returns to the dust from which it came and the spirit returns to the Father which gave it. So in natural death, there's a separation. But we could also die a death and still be walking in this earth. We can be separated from many things in our life. That day, that day, Adam was separated from the peace, the joy, the liberty, the comfort, the, the fearlessness, the uh, lack of anxiety, lack of distress, uh, the lack of toil. He was separated from all of that. And now he's going to face the rest of his life uh, enduring the death penalty for disobeying God. Well, we know what happened. First thing that they, in verse number seven, first thing that happened, they, uh, they found shame. They had never experienced shame before. Verse number seven says, 
they knew that they were naked. That means that they were ashamed of themselves. Never having been ashamed before. That must have been a shock to their intellect. Wouldn't you agree? They were now ashamed simply because Adam had disobeyed God and death had come to them. All right? When the Lord came, as it seems that he was accustomed to do, uh, in verse number 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord, uh, uh, Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife uh, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Why? Because they were now in a state of death. Shame had set upon them, and they hid themselves among the trees in the garden because death had come to them. Shame uh, uh, and the guilt and the penalty of sin was now upon them. All right. Notice verse number 10. When the Lord arrived, he said, um, Adam said, he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and was afraid. Well, we've seen shame. Now we see fear. They've never had fear before. Now they've experienced fear because they are dead uh, to Eden, to pleasure that they'd once had. He says, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And the Lord said, he said, who told thee that thou was naked? How did you find out that you were naked? Then he asked him, hast thou eat of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? God is pointing out to them, I gave you a commandment, you disobeyed my commandment, now you're a dead man. You are dead uh, to your uh, innocence. You're now dead uh, to your peace. You're afraid now. Now all of these things are going to continue with Adam and all of his posterity after him. In verse number 12, the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. You know, uh, right there is the first marital discord. I don't believe that they'd had any, any discord up to this point because they were dwelling in a place called pleasure. But death had now come. Their perfect marital bliss was now shattered because Adam had disobeyed God's commandment. Well, it continues on. And verse number 16. Unto the woman, the Lord said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, every time I see a man begin to smile when he hears that, I need to remind every one of us. And this is a warning. This is a commandment of God too. Hold your hand right there and turn with me to the Ephesian letter, chapter 5. You know, we Christian people have been accused of a lot of things. Demeaning our wives. And not holding them in great respect. I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul and his apostolic authority, what he commands us. By the way, when an, when an apostle commands us, it's a commandment for God, from God. He's, he's just simply God's messengers. All right. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 25, Paul commands the husbands, husbands love your wives and just how much and what manner do we love our wives? Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now husbands are commanded from God to love our wives as God has loved us, as the Lord has loved us. We're going to look in a moment and see how much he has loved us. We are to be prepared uh, to give our very lives for our wives. Uh, and and, and I, I, have never, I have never found any place in the scripture where God sanctions the mistreatment of a wife, nor of a husband, as a matter of fact, in America. You know, I've heard it preached many times that when God took the, the rib from Adam, he didn't take it from his feet, didn't take it from his head, but took it from his side that they might be helpmates together, that they may walk together side by side in this life, complementing each other and working together. All right. Now back to our subject in Genesis chapter 3. For Adam, the Lord God said unto him, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 17, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, 
and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. That's three times that God has said to him, I told you not to do that, and you did it. All right? Saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed be the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy, of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Anybody ever picked field peas before? Raise your hands. I want to see your hands. Picked field peas. I love them when they're on the table, but I guarantee you, when you reach down there and there's a blackberry thorn growing up there amongst it, and you picking those peas and you skin your hands on the blackberry thorn, and over here there's a there's a hill of ants, and uh, you better if and you get down there close to the low the bottom area. And you better be careful when you pull the leaves back. You might uncover a water moccasin down there too. And it's hot and there's flies and there's mosquitoes and there's gnats and it's dirty and it's nasty and it's hard work and I'm glad we got Walmart. Now, God meant what he said. That you're going to have to toil for what you eat as opposed to the place called pleasure or eaten where they simply just went and collected the fruit and they ate it. They were dead, dead to the blessings and the peace that they had once had. But we have a little hint in verse number 22 of what Paul teaches us in Romans 5 and 6. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. Now remember we talked about the great love. In spite of Adam's sin, God loved him. And he knew that he was afraid and shame had set upon him because he was now guilty of sin. But God loved him, so he he walked up he walked up to that bear. And he says, Mr. Bear, I want to borrow your coat for Adam and Eve. No. He had to take the life of an animal whereby he might clothe, hide the shame of Adam and Eve. Beginning, beginning just shortly after this, for about four 4,000 years, there would be sacrifices uh, so that, that the children of Israel might have some sense of relief from their shame of their sin and be reminded that one day there would be one who would come who would take away the penalty of their sin. Right at verse number 23, they were driven from the garden. Now, I want you to go with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> now, I want you to follow me through this chapter. Because I want us to consider three things here. The doctrine of total depravity. The doctrine of original sin. And the doctrine of grace. First of all, Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1. Paul says, therefore being uh, justified by faith, we have... What? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's peace that we can enjoy in this life because of what he's about to tell us. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace. That's what we're doing this morning. We are, by God's grace, he's opened the door and we have access to it this morning. We can look at the promises of God, the same God who issued the commandment, man disobeyed the commandment, God punished the man, and we are under the penalty of that punishment by nature, but now we can open the door and look at that grace and see how God has blessed us and he's promised to yet bless us even with a greater blessing. All right? Verse number three, he says, and not also, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. So he says, as we suffer, even these sufferings look forward 
point is to something far better. All right, verse number five. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. We know these things to be so this morning because there's something in us that makes us know that it's so and makes us rejoice in it. All right. Verse number six. For when we were yet without strength. Now, when did we lose this strength? In Genesis chapter three and verse number six, when Adam disobeyed God, man lost this strength. The strength to recover ourselves. The strength to uh, to live uh, in such a way that God would see us without spot and without blemish. All right? In due time, Christ died for the what? Ungodly. That is, in this chapter, the first declaration in this, in this chapter, the first of three, uh, where we're declared to be in a state of depravity. So if God died for you, he died for you when you were what? Ungodly. That means that you had no godliness about you. That means you were in a state of death, being separated from God in a spiritual sense, that you were in the state of of total depravity or sin, making you undesirable to God. Okay? Let's read on. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die... Yet preadventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. And so the question to us is, well, just who would you die for? Well, we already read that, we, that husbands are commanded to die for their wives if necessary. But who would you give your life for? Who do you think enough of that you would stand and take a bullet for them? You know, if you follow the order of the military and the secret services and this sort of thing of our country, uh, certain government officials, including the president, there are those who are designated. If the president comes under assault, they are commanded to get between the but the gun and the president. They're to put themselves in the harm's way for the safety of the president. As a matter of fact, that's one of the oaths that are taken to defend the Constitution and the president of the United States. Uh, because uh he is to be preserved alive. So the question is, well, just who do you think enough of to put yourself in harm's way, knowing that you would die? Just who do you uh, think highly enough that you would give your life uh, to preserve their life? But now, listen to verse number eight. God answers. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet what? Sinners. While we were yet in the state of sin... Now, if you were yet sinners and ungodly, what have you done to make yourself fit for heaven or just for heaven? Ungodly? You know, uh, remember Job's question? Can can an, uh, a clean thing come from an unclean thing? Absolutely not. And so he says, when you were in a state of ungodliness and you were sinners, Christ died for us. Can you imagine that? And he's talking about now, for a, were you a good person then? Uh, were we so good that Jesus Christ looked and said, that is such a good person. I mean, that's an outstanding man. That is a wonderful woman. They are so perfect that I'm going to make sure that they get to heaven. Well, he did look. Numbers of places in the scripture. Uh, he says that God did look. And what did he see? He says, there's none that loves the Lord, none that obeys. They're all sinners. As a matter of fact, Paul even says it here in Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what did he see? He saw nothing but a world of sinners. But because of his great love that he chose uh, to minister to a particular people, he sent his son to give his life for them. All right? So we were ungodly and we were sinners when Christ died for us. We'll read on. Much more than being now, now, 2,000 years ago now, justified by his what? Now, if you're justified by his blood, that's a clear, concise, a terminal statement there, meaning that it was his blood that rendered us just before God. It's not his blood and your confession. It's not his blood and your repentance. It's not your blood and your, his blood and your calling. It's not his blood and your obedience. It is his blood, period. Who shall be saved from wrath 
through him. For if when we were, number three, for if when we were what? Enemies. Enemy, that means somebody, if you have an enemy, that means that person wants to do you harm. When we were ungodly, we were sinners, we were enemies with uh, against our God, we were reconciled to God by the what? By the death of his son, not his death and anything. Not his death in your confession, not his death in your calling, not his death in your repentance, not his death in your obedience, but his death, period, is what reconciled you to God. What does reconcile mean? That which was imputed to you? That means that debt what that was communicated to you. It's like all of a sudden God says, you know that $16 million you had, a debt you had? $16 trillion. That $16 trillion debt that you had, you don't have it anymore. It's all taken care of. It's lifted off of you. Wouldn't it be great if somebody were to walk in here this morning and say, you know all that debt y'all got? You don't have it anymore. That's what Jesus Christ said on the cross. When he declared in John chapter 19, he says, it is finished. He says, you don't have a debt anymore. He says, I cleared that debt, that penalty of death that was passed upon you from your father Adam. He says, I have resolved it. And you have life eternal in me. That's what Jesus Christ said when he said on the cross, it is finished. All right. Verse number 11, and not uh, only uh, so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. He says, now we are justified, and now we've received the atonement. This now, Paul wrote this some 2,000 years ago, so if it was now then, then it's now now. Wouldn't you agree? It was now before we were born. It was now before we conceived. It was now before grandma and grandpa were born or conceived, agree? Jesus Christ did it even before uh, we were in our mama's arms. Jesus Christ gave his life for us long before we arrived on this earth. Verse number 12. Wherefore, also, now we come to the original sin. Are you ready? Wherefore, as by how many men? One man. What entered into the world? Sin. Now, I want to be honest with you. There's not a whole lot of people in the Christian community that believes this passage. As a matter of fact, it's just passed over. But let me ask you a question. What did Jesus Christ die for? As a matter of fact, when the angel spoke to Joseph, Mary's husband, in Matthew 1 and 21... For he shall do what? Save his people from their sins. John chapter 19, he says, it is finished. What had he done? Saved his people from their sins. You know, even a boy from the swamp can understand that. And so I believe that if Jesus says he's finished it, what is he finished? He's finished uh, saving us from our sins. In order to do that, he had to justify us with his blood. He had to reconcile us to God the Father by giving his life. Now, what does it mean to reconcile? Well, he either runs any kind of business or keeps keep the, the, the family uh, uh, financial books. Every month you need to sit down and reconcile uh, your, your debt, your bills, your income. And so that what comes in is at least equal to what goes out. That's a problem we have in our country today. More is going out than what's coming in. We ought to reconcile that uh, periodically at least, should we not? That's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He reconciled it to the point that you are now you're sinless before God the Father. You're without debt before God the Father. Uh, you haven't violated any law according to God the Father when he looks at you because Jesus Christ bore that sin within his person. Remember Paul said that he was made to be sin for you and me? That means he took that imputed sin in his person and he bore it away from us, all right? Verse number 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, we've already talked about it, haven't we? Death came as a result of sin. Who sinned now? Now, that word sin, look at your Bibles with me just a moment. Is that word singular or plural? Singular. All right, so who sin is he talking about? Adam sinned. If he was talking, now we're all guilty of our sins. Uh, Psalm 51, David talks about being conceived in sin. That means in the point he was conception, he was a sinner. But he also talked about his own sins. Uh, so what, the, the truth of the matter is, our sins we commit contribute to our depravity. 
Can, can we say it that way? All right. Now, so death passed upon who? All men, for that all have done what? So, have you ever had anybody tell you that they're not a sinner? You ever had anybody tell you that? If you, if you, um, spend any time talking to folks about what you believe, uh, sooner or later, I'm not gonna call any religious orders, but there are some religious orders that will say to you that I, I'm not a sinner. I'm gonna give you a passage of scripture to use when you hear that. And I do want you to talk to folks about what you believe. But I also want to load your gun. You know, well, you know, sharpen your sword. Let's put it that way. That's more biblical in nature, you know. Uh, <clears throat> go with me to 1 John chapter 1. I'm going to give you a passage of scripture to handle that issue. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 8. John says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Not only that, in verse number 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the truth is not in us. All right? So the point is, if we say that we have no sin or that we're not sinners, then what are we? That's exactly right. We are. And so we are all, all men have fallen into the state of sin as a result of what Adam did. The penalty and the guilt of that sin well, was imputed unto us. All right, but we're not through yet. Go back with me to Romans chapter 5 now. Verse number 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So even if you can live your life without committing a sin, are you a sinner? Yes, you are, because that which is imputed to you from Adam, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so as so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of uh, one many be be, uh, dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by how many? One man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. All right, so the point there is one man brought sin and the other man brought grace. So where are you? You're the recipient of the imputed sin and you're also the recipient of the imputed grace. So what did you do to inherit that sin? Nothing. Just simply being a human being. What did you do to inherit this grace? Nothing. Simply because God made choice uh, of you to send his son to die for you, to shed his blood for you, uh, so that you might be rendered just and to be reconciled to God the Father who were not reconciled uh, for when Adam uh, disobeyed God in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6. All right. Let's look at some other illustrations concerning the original sin. Verse number 16, uh, verse number 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. So he's given us a supposition. Did it happen? One man sinned? Yes, we go, well, the penalty of it. Much more, uh, they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by how many? One. So in the first man, Adam, we lost it. In the second one, man, Jesus Christ, we gained it. And it was all by what? Grace. All right. If it's by grace, then it's not of works, we're told. All right. So what is grace? You talk about people acting graciously. That means they treat you real nice, right? But grace in this context means that you have received something that you don't deserve. Now, people don't like to hear that. You know, our human nature uh, likes to hear how good we are. I like to tell people what I think of them. Well, some people I do. But among y'all, I like to tell you what I think of you. I like to tell you I love you. I like to tell you uh, what a joy it is to serve alongside you in this life. I like to tell you how proud I am of you in Christ. Well, sometimes people don't act that way. But what about those who, before they were born to the Spirit, they persecuted the church? They threw people in prison simply because they were preaching the gospel that we were trying to preach this morning. Could you love that person? There was a man named Saul of Tarsus who was persecuting the church, throwing people in prison, men, women, throwing them in prison. 
and consented into their death. He even held the coach of those who stoned Stephen to death because he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But yet God the Father loved him. I loved him so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to give his life for you. Now how strong a love is it that the Father, the Father, who has a perfect love, would send his perfect son to give his perfect life for an imperfect people? How wonderful is that? All right. Verse number 18. Therefore, as by the offense of how many? One. Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So again and again and again, over and over again, Paul, he's, Paul is approaching it from every angle to make sure that everybody can get the point. We became sinners because of one man's disobedience. We became just, holy, and godly because of one man's obedience. One man brought sin, and the other one brought grace. Now, let's skip on over for the sake of time to Romans chapter 6 and verse number 22. Paul says, but now being made free from what? Does that mean you don't sin? No. What that means is you're freed from the eternal penalty of sin. There is an eternal penalty for sin. And you're freed from it because Jesus Christ shed his blood for you and gave his life for you. But now being made free from sin... And, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and, and the in everlasting life. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, you can look forward to the day that the Lamb of God will appear in the heavens and He will command again. And that command will go like this. Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's a commandment. And this is a commandment uh, that, that you're passive in. You don't have a choice. You won't have a choice to disobey that command. That means he is going to take you and convey you to a place that Jesus Christ himself called paradise. That perfect peace and joy for eternity. Oh my goodness, I wish I had about two hours to talk about that right now. I like thinking about paradise, do you? I like thinking about the holiness, the sweetness, the joy, the pleasing eternity that we'll enjoy in the place called paradise. All right, let's conclude with verse number 23. For the wages of sin is what? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So I ask you, this morning, to consider the doctrine of original sin and total depravity and be prepared to defend it. May God bless you, my prayer.